Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Our special guest today is Carol Martin, dear friend of mine from Victoria, country Victoria, and she's been sharing with us what's been going on with her in the recent past, and we've heard about the ghostly phenomena in her uh, new rental place, and these strange visitors have been showing up. One of them seems to me to be not quite human, uh, but at any rate, uh, it's good to have you back, Carol. Welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Thank you, James. Well, tell us a, a bit about has your my lab experiences changed much over time? Uh, is there like a basic profile? I know a lot of times from a my lab perspective, you just wind up somewhere and you just oh. either in you're in the militant operator mode or you're kind of like, what the f am I doing here? Kind yep. of mode or some kind of muted state of consciousness in between. Mm -hmm. uh, what's it been like from the past going forward? In the recent past, what seems to be the uh, mission profile, the objective, if you will? Where, where do you tend to find yourselves, uh, yourself in some of these ops in the recent past? So in the recent past, I would know exactly what I'm there to do. And like I said before, I, when I'm on the other side doing a mission, it's always the same faces. So everybody becomes familiar to me um i could if they were in a crowd i would go him him and him her her and her i know exactly who they are i know where i am but lately i don't know where i am i don't know where i am and it seems to me like there's a little bit of a change and i actually spoke to a friend of mine because i was just like beside myself a little bit and i'm like i don't know what's going on like one minute I'm sleeping, the next minute I'm in this uh, military truck and the guy who's driving is bloody Jason Momoa because I saw his face. I actually saw, and I'm like, how come they're using celebrity faces now? I said, come on, I'm old school. I've been doing this for a long time. What, why, why are they doing putting a celebrity face? Why? Who's behind that face? Why are they masking that person? That's really, that's really bizarre for me. Um, getting hit, that's another one. He gave me a biggest backhander and gave me this, this weapon and it was a really chunky type gun type of thing. But this, the, the front bit was a square, like, a, like Thor's hammer, but it was... I think, and he just went, get out and do what you're told. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, <laughs> hopped out, went to do what I was there to do, hopped back in, and I would wake up, bang. And I'm like, I have never, ever even thought about Jason Momoa. I don't even like the guy. Oh, yeah. me neither. No, he's got there's some it's, weird it's things about him. Yeah. But it's just bizarre, James. I'm not that type of person to swoon over a celebrity. Don't think of them. They're never in my mind. But apparently he was in the military truck giving me a backhander, handing me this weapon, and I had to get out quick, smart. I ran to these really big, they had, they had these cages so I unlocked these cages and there's all these kids in there. Oh. So I unlocked them and I ran back to the um, vehicle and I woke up. I woke up. So that's been very bizarre for me because I, no. Were these no. kids uh, attended, watched over, guarded yeah. or? They were guarded. So the person I assume went the opposite way. I lifted up the latch and all of them just ran out and then I had to run back to the truck that's all I remember yeah as I said to a friend that that's to me it's because I remember from start to finish everything what was said what I was wearing I didn't even know this time what I was wearing nothing because I couldn't I couldn't uh pass the fact that this stupid celebrity yeah just gave me a biggest backhander for no reason because I wouldn't comply to his wishes. And what was he asking you to do at the time? Yeah, he took to take the weapon 
Oh, okay. You know, I didn't want to take it because it, it was really, really heavy. And he gave me a backhand and he goes, do what you told. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, who the hell are you? Uh, Never, ever. You, you mentioned upon seeing him uh, in relating the story to me that yeah. this is how they're making themselves appear at this particular time. So yeah. uh, I, you know, I don't want to put your words in your mouth, but like the way I take that is that's how whoever sent him there to yeah. do that job wanted him to appear to be perceived by you as Jason Momoa, but you didn't feel it was really Jason Momoa. It was just some, they superimpose his face and whatever technology, whatever cloning ability they got, a grafting ability, that's, that's right. what they did, or a mask or something. Yeah, it was right down to his silly tattoos that he has because, ah. like I said, every time I go on a mission and I've spoken to him, I've spoken of him to you a long time ago and his name is Joachim. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask so, you about him. Yes, so... Every single time I've seen this man, he started off, I mean, like, I assume we all age when we're there, when we're off world and we're constantly at that place because he's never here on earth. Um, and I know this man has trained me from start to finish and he had long hair, kind of like a German accent, which he still has to this day. But now his hair is short. Mm -hmm. And I'm always there with him. Nobody else. I like I go and it's like, yes, sir, I'm here. He goes, now you do, 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 gives me the orders and off I go. Off I go. But never like this. Never go to bed, wake up, and then all of a sudden I'm being slapped and manhandled by Jason Momoa. I'm like, couldn't you pick Vigo Mortensen or something nice? <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand that. Like I said to a friend, I just. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes you wonder, is it, is it under new management? Was it a different group that accessed you to do that? Yeah, or? So that's what I thought. Like, that's why I asked you, like, how do you find out what kind of program or group you're in? Because I've never seen these people in my life. And it's always been the same people. Even when I was training, even when I found myself in those big black mansions, you know, you'd run upstairs and you'd uh, walk in and everything with those gaudy bloody carpets and the red flowers on there. Ugh. And you'd always see the same people, always, always. Um, so then they become like family to you. And so then all of a sudden now it's just changed. I, I don't know where I am. I don't know anything. And I just feel so displaced. Like why am I finding myself? That's fine. The mission is fine. Yep take the latch, make the kids free and save them, right, so they can have a chance to run to wherever they need to run to. I, the thought process wasn't really like that when you're in there. But it's just like afterwards you're thinking, why have they put me in that circumstance? And it wasn't just once, it's been three times, twice with that person that looks like Jason Momoa. I won't say it's him because – and – um. And it's like twice and he's hit me twice and the second time second time was really interesting because I never think of this person for good reason and um I don't even really want to say his name you but, don't have to you can tell me later on you know off camera yeah. but so this is, person, is it like a well-known person or is it someone in our field or is it yeah very well-known person not a lot of people like him but uh -huh. anyway yeah, so he when when this person hit me, it was the strangest thing. Like we were like in a big mess tent, finished what I had to do, and he gave me a backhander again. And I'm like, I'm freaking out. I'm like, I can't. I'm looking around trying to find someone who is familiar to me, and then all of a sudden this person comes running that we know who he is. And um, started screaming and yelling, don't you hurt her and Rara, who the hell do you think you are walking in and hitting her like that? And he just went off his head, th um, threw profanities around and they had a kerfuffle and scuffle or whatever. So the person and that hit you is somebody well-known 
I'm guessing in our field or somewhat related to it, not necessarily a celebrity type, but somebody in yeah. okay. or somebody that that don't want me seeing his face. Uh huh. And the and, person who got mad at him was yeah, who, was like one, another another individual that was there. So that was the individual that most people know who he is. Uh-huh. And then I just don't feel comfortable. Oh, it's quite all right. Yeah, don't mention I that. don't want problems because I've never really delved into or spoke of what he did a long time ago to me. And um, to this day, I just still have a problem with that because, yeah. like I say to everybody, I'm nothing and nobody in the circle. Nobody knows who I am anyway. And I don't understand why seeing this person, even way back when we were training, I was being trained by Awakim and he would be there. I did see him quite a few times there and I just don't understand why this person came running to my defence when I can't stand him. Yes. But thank you anyway. I don't know. So then I thought to myself, you and you, are you somehow connected and that little circle of people connected? And um, I thought, no, I'm really not uncomfortable. So I put my feelers out and said, you know, I'm not uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with this. I'm not doing it anymore. And since I've done that, thank goodness that that's hopefully been listened to and I've not seen that person anymore nothing and it's been quiet i've been well, actually good. the quiet that i've not had a mission since that time well good since the stargate incident and have not seen either faces but um yeah it's just very bizarre how you know those two knew each other but one I'm like you're you're not really Jason, and the other one I don't even want to know. Don't come yeah. to my after what you did. So now, just found it very weird. In contrast, a lot of your previous missions would there be a, a debriefing when you came back, or you would know that? You, yeah, you, I can give you, you an example. Yeah, please. Yeah, I can give you an example. So there was one mission. Went to, I just knew in the middle of the day because there would be, I was listening to Spotify in my car and Joachim's name came up on Spotify. I've got a photo off that I can send it to you later. <laughs> no word of the lie. And I'm like, what is going on? I start laughing. I'm like, oh, you miss me <laughs> because I'm quite good at what I do, quite fearless. And just a little thing like that, and I thought, oh, here we go. Got home, then, you know, you get personality changes here, there, and everywhere. My daughter's like, oh, you okay, mum? Yep, I'm good. And then, you know, she would go to work and I'd be at home by myself, which is always good when I'm, like, in that mood. So I know that I'm going to get pulled in because everything changes. Like, you know, that day I might go shopping and push in the trolley and get zapped a million times mm. and it's like, oh. and it's always, when I think back to how many times I've been zapped on the trolley, it's just been phenomenal. And then at you, work. You mean static electricity of some kind? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even today when I went shopping, and it's just like, oh, unreal. So, um, yeah, I, I just know. I just know. So then when I had this mission, I went to sleep and found myself at the mess tent. Joachim was on this long table, black shirt, um, army pants, you know, the cargo khaki pants he seems to wear all the time. Um, and then he was drinking what, coffee or something. I don't know, whatever they drink over there. I don't know. I'd never eat or drink anything when I'm there. And he goes, about time, woman, because that's how he speaks to me. And he said, you've got to come and see these maps. And he had this long map on this long table. And I'm looking at these maps. He goes, make sure you remember everything because I can't give it to you. Fine. 
remembered everything. I'm looking and I'm looking, trying to like picture everything in my head. He's given me orders. This is where you've got to go. This is what time you have to leave here to get to this destination and everything and so forth and so forth. So, yeah, I do know exactly why I'm there. Um, there's been other times where I've got there and because, you know, I don't like to comply very much. <laughs> and I'm, sometimes I'm a bit naughty and he has uh, punished me for it. Mm. So my one punishment was he dragged me by the hair into this little tiny white vehicle, you could say. Uh, it looked like a little type bullet thing. It would hover. There was no wheels on there, whatever. It was like, you know, running on magnets. It would lift up and it would go. Um, they had like, it would lift up like a train track kind of mm. thing. And he took me to a place where we got off on a platform and there was like a sea of sheds. It was just shed upon dilapidated sheds upon sheds for miles and miles and miles and miles. And all I saw were these women and children and they were just in a poor state just in a poor state. They were starving. They were smelly, dirty. Were they, uh, good. Were they confined? It wasn't good. Were they confined? It looked like they were living out of these little sheds and they were just being used for whatever purpose. I am not sure, James. I can't tell you, but I didn't. My heart broke seeing it. And then Joachim said, if you don't start complying, I'll throw you in there. And I went, no, you wouldn't. Because after a while you get to speak back and you have that guts to even speak back to him, which I don't do much often because I know, you know. <laughs> and um, he goes, if you don't do as you are told, I'm just going to throw you in there. I'll throw you to the wolf's carol. If you... And that's the thing, like everybody has, um, what's that? There's somebody different. They see themselves as a different aspect of themselves, you know. But this is what I even had another question. Why when I go, it's me. Yeah, I'm a little bit slimmer, but I go by my real name. They call me by my real name. Um, even when I was in one of those mansions and saw the person, we both know who this person was, they call him by his name and I just found I, I can't, no one can give me an answer to that question. So that was very strange. But, yeah, Joachim did punish me a lot by showing me something that he knew would absolutely tear up my heart and seeing kids just in squalor. Yes. So after that I did comply to his wishes and I just became better at it and much better and just shushing. He's never gotten into the field with you. He just sends you out and is there when you get back. No, he has gone into the field with me. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh-huh. He has. And um, I don't know why I'm always with him. I'm always with become, and I don't like talking like this because people will think, oh, yeah, right. But after a certain time, and it's been a long time since I was 15 years old, James, I've been trained by this man because I've always seen him and I've actually drawn him with his long hair it's still in it's still packed and it's in the shed with everything else I have not had time to unpack it but um I drew to the best of my ability as to what he looked like um I've lost my train of thought now oh, no I was just curious because I'm always it, with him always. in contrast to the more recent experiences where you just suddenly find yourself in a place and then after the, you know, you've completed whatever task you were meant to complete, suddenly you're sent mm -hmm. back and, and you wake wake up in, in bed. It's like mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily saying that it's, and hopefully they'll all completely stop, you know, at least mm -hmm. for a while. But it, it's either they decided to do these last two missions, leave Joachim out of the equation. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah, Joachim, yeah, Joachim. So, yeah, he, he's your regular guy, so to speak. Yeah. Some would call him a handler or a controller, whatever the case may be. But yeah. he's not involved in these, these most recent instances. He has so. not been around. I've not seen him, James, and that's what I don't like because I'm like, 
where is Joachim? I yeah. just, every single time without fail, I am with this man. He's, and you're right, because he's the one who's trained me, so he's some kind of handler. Yes, you see, because he's not in the picture suddenly. Uh -oh. And then suddenly these other characters, the Jason Momoa fake, and then the other person, I'm starting to suspect who I think this other person is. Um, this other person has been on documentaries and whatnot before? Yeah. Okay. So I can't talk to him. You know, like, it really, really upsets me, James, because he has absolutely destroyed my life. And um, not not in that one that you're thinking of either, but he is so dark. And it took me a long time to get over what he did to me that I even ended up in hospital. And um, I just don't understand, like, when you go into these missions and you see a celebrity's face and then you see another one who has hurt you beyond hurt, physically and mentally hurt. Um, I, I just don't understand why he... Yes, because that's the worst possible head. person to put there. Yeah. If yeah. they wanted to keep you in a kind of, I wouldn't say a happy frame of mind, but more of a focused frame of mind, hmm. that's how he would be the last person to bring around because that's right. it, it'll tend to put you in a dysregulated state. Mm -hmm. Uh and then you're you're in the push and pull between Jason on the one hand and him on the other. Yes. It's like they decided, okay, we're going to radically change things up for whatever reason. Yeah, maybe it's a, maybe it's a temporary thing with Joaquin not being around. Maybe That's it's fun. a more permanent thing. But instead, they go get these two mm -hmm. jokers, uh, yep. and then they change the the mission profile, and then you know how the sequence mm -hmm. usually plays out. All of a sudden, yeah. Because all of a sudden I am being told what to do by somebody I have no, I, I don't know who you are. Why am I taking orders from you? And for you to like manhandle me like some, you know, sack of potatoes is just uncalled for. For one, yes. I was just like. So that's what's changed and it's happened. I've seen him twice, but the missions like that have happened three times. I, I don't understand I really don't understand and I don't understand why the other person came to my defense either when he's had um when he's just been my torturer, let's say, for many, many, many years. And I, I just don't understand. But then like a little part of me, I remove myself from certain people and have stopped you know, conversing and watching their videos and everything else because I just felt like I was being pulled in um, in a direction. So I'm not sure if... That had, I can't tell you um, because, you know, when, when you move house and you're trying to settle in and everything else, it's just... Um, you don't have time to actually sit down and think about it. And now that I am settled, I don't know if I want to. Um, but, like, the question is, like, can that group of people create that kind of negative, I don't know, feeling or whatever? What's the word? I don't know. That, that mission, can they create it? Can they say pull her in? We just want we want her in this. Yes, yeah, so, because they're, it had nothing to just, do. With that. That they're was, just you know, misogynists like, and they're psychopaths, and they they think you know just, yeah. just use you like as a as, as a tool exactly. basically. Uh -huh. now, now you mentioned yeah. you had two other experiences with these two jokers before. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned going in the truck, getting backhanded, and then letting letting the kids out. What were the other two that had happened? Uh, after that so they were very very similar i found myself under uh, underneath a base or whatever like every time i'm in this military truck i look over and i just see cages upon cages upon cages like the concrete this is what stuck out for me where i'm, I'm looking at the concrete going that was so thick and i'm thinking oh my god there will be no way no way these kids could get out of 
where where they were because this concrete they were like more than a meter thick no way you couldn't even hear them scream they were muffled it was just a nightmare absolute nightmare and all i remember is running and running and running and just flicking up all these latches and just kicking the gates open and it, the gates actually went inwards not outwards so um and they were just packed in it's like sardines all these little tiny faces and all i remember thinking i've just got to open up these latches just got to open up these latches and that's all i remember doing that's all I remember doing. Um, the very last mission took me took me a bit to go, what in the hell? Because I've not been anywhere like that since the beginning of everything. And I found myself in a mall and I found myself going up these stairs, down the stairs, um, taking weird-ass lifts that were elevators that were dome-shaped, mm. like they weren't. The doors were flat, but once the, it was open, inside was like a half dome. That was very weird. And it was all concrete and stainless steel. And I'm just going up the elevator, down the elevator, down the steps, up a platform, another platform. And I'm like, and I was getting frustrated because I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? I've not done this since I was a kid. Yeah. Like this is so I don't know, well, is this a memory or is this, you know, usually I don't have the memories. I just have the missions and I remember what I do. I wake up, I write them down and I just found them really weird. So I got up to, I think it was a third level and who awaits me are the three idiots that I thought, what the hell is oh. going on? So it was that Jason Momoa. It was the other guy and one other, and I'm not afraid to say his name, but Michael Aquino, uh, he was standing there and I'm looking at all three of them and I'm thinking, I think I want to wake up. And I'm trying my best to, to wake up and my kids actually heard me screaming in my sleep. And you know how you have that muffled scream? Yeah, yeah. And you have someone like having a nightmare or anything and you're trying to wake up, trying to wake up. And eventually, I just woke up, and I, just, I yeah, thought, that was that is just weird. I don't want nothing to do with them. Well, where's where's your Joachim? Where's everybody else? Has my program shifted or no? And then that that's the third one. Then that's when I said, "No, nah, that's enough. Don't touch me anymore. I don't want to do it." And so far, touch wood, been quiet. Hopefully they've listened, or was it just like you said, a one-off thing? And but I just find it very strange that everything got changed. Well, what I, seems to happen on on some occasions for certain my labs is they get abducted, for lack of a better term, by another control group that they're not familiar with. Mm. Like they have the regular one, and it. it it could be service related where it could be like air force army or navy right and then what happens is they get accessed by some other group not their the normal group that manipulates them but some other group and then you come under their control and they mm -hmm. do things differently right yeah. like uh like you know, like there'll be offshoots of like cia controlled groups or nsa groups that mess with my labs and other project people and when they find out and one of the ways they bait kind of the system to use the bait term is whether it is it's in a forum or a chat room or you know by monitoring the con the comments of various threads mm -hmm. when someone identifies himself as a my lab or a project person then they're going to find out about that person if they don't already know about them and then when they can confirm for themselves that yes this person has been used in in, in ops before let's start accessing this person so yeah. so that happens where you one moment you're with a familiar installations familiar people familiar mission profile next thing you know you you're accessed by a completely different group and yeah. you know all kinds of weird things happen yeah i know who i was talking to prior to everything and 
like I said, I've just removed myself from them all because after a while you just put two and two together, don't you? And I just have to within myself thinking, well, nothing like that ever happened before, before prior to me going into this and, and chatting, talking to them or whatever. So, and then when I removed myself, nothing's happened ever since. I find that quite amusing, but never again, never again. That was, that was dark. That was yes. not normal. The feeling when I saw that person that was running to my defense and I'm like, no, oh, no, nah, nah, get away from me. Get away. I'd rather die on my knees than you helping me. No, get away from me. And, um, yeah, just found that really, really odd. Well, it is. And they're, what's the term? Um, I guess there's a method to their madness. Mm. In some cases, they like to keep my labs in and out of ops, not necessarily during ops, but sometimes leading up to an op. And at times, an agitated, angry, impulsive state. Other times things may be going on with that individual or they may getting be getting some external manipulation that makes them anxiety ridden and uh you know having all, all these like emotional issues right but really That's what i was the- in I'm, i was an emotional basket case because of everything that went on in my personal life i was just a ball of mess so they really used me good and proper, I guess you can say. Yes, yeah, that's what I was getting at. That Advantage they, of me. They could have just used you in a normal fashion without that whole uh, emotional baggage overload. It was it was cruel, actually, mm-hmm. for them, to, 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 on top of everything else, to put that guy back into the picture. Yeah. Yes, that was, uh, that was a cruel blow. That was, I was a mess for days on end because... Just, you know, after a while, you never, ever expect to see its face again. And I've been pretty, pretty good um, avoiding and cleaning my space and never to have to see him. Um, And then you see him and you just, like, back to square one and I was just, you just don't understand, like, all these questions go through your head and, but now, you know, past it and everything else, I'm just talking about it. But, um, yeah, thank goodness that's all over. I've not, don't even feel him around, which is really, really good. So. Well, that's good. Um, let, let's rewind to uh, some of the training and, and the ops you went on as a young girl. Now, did the training start in what used to be Yugoslavia? I don't, I'm not sure what. So my training, James, was very weird. Like a lot of people go, yep, I trained off world. And I said, yeah, but I trained at home. Like I remember when I was little, and I was just talking about this to my daughter today. And I started giggling because I'm like, oh my God. And um, I remember like coming home from school and they would do, because my next door neighbor was a sergeant in the military. Um, all his brothers, he had five brothers, they were all officers in the military. My dad was in the military. All dad's family was. My mother's side of the family, they were all, apart from the women, were in the military. They were, you know, soldiers. And But on dad's side, they were officers and whatnot. Um, and John next door, he was a sergeant. So we would, I'd come home and he goes, How's your day, love? And I said, yeah, good, being little. And I remember in the backyard he'd set up all this equipment and we'd like run up and I said to Maddie, oh, I remember um, we used to put a plank of wood up against the fence so we'd have like six tyres because my dad back then worked for tire, Olympic tyre in, in Victoria. It was a huge um place where they made tires for cars trucks whatever and he'd bring home tires or whatever to because <laughs> croatians and the lemon trees right so they would have tires for the lemon tree and um he would fix all this and i'm like what's going on and he goes oh come on so every day after school i would be trained to go through this process of 
you know, running through, hopping through tyres and um, crawling underneath the ropes. He, we, he would set up ropes and you would have to crawl underneath. And then as you crawl underneath, we'd have a big runner because we had a big backyard and we would run and up that wooden plank and we would jump the fence onto his side. And on his side, he would have like a like a blow up mattress or whatever, old mattress, and we would land on that. And that would happen every every day, every day. And then when John K used to come home from, he was still going to Vietnam, and he would um, be stationed at a place called Pakapanyal here in Victoria. And he would come home, he would come home in the army trucks. And when he did come home, because we didn't see him for a long time, he would scoop us kids and put us at the back of the army truck. Now, who who was this that was doing this to you? Our next door neighbor. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was very bizarre. Anyway, so he would all chuck us in and he'd drive us around. He'd take us to the drive-ins in the army vehicle and we'd watch a movie and it was just very bizarre. Um, afterwards, that's when I saw the disc, a UFO in the sky. John was out there, called Dad, called me. But he said the most strangest thing. He said, Carol, I think this this is your family. And I'm like, little, so I don't understand. I didn't understand until much later what he meant. And I just remember standing there looking at this grey disc in the sky. And then after a long while, Mum would call me to come inside to have dinner. And um, that's when we left and went back to Croatia and we lived there. And then when we lived there, my dad taught me everything. Mm -hmm. He would teach me about guns, how to take them apart, how to put them together, how to clean them, um, target shooting, everything, everything. Um you know, because back in the day when where my grandmother is, we had to whisper in the house because we weren't allowed to talk in a normal voice just in case the Gestapos were standing at the door eavesdropping because back then everybody still had a photo of Tito, the president, on the wall and they used to come in and make check to see if it was clean and spotless. And oh, jeez. Yeah, they would run their white glove on the thing. Oh, it was horrifying. And um, so that, you know... That's how I grew up. And then all of a sudden you grow up like that where your father would make you stand at attention and call you his little soldier. And it was oh. just just me, no no one, no, my, not my sister or anything like that. Just found it odd. And you're thinking, why did you do that to me? Yes. Uh, you know, building the obstacle course yeah. with all the tires and whatnot. Yep. With all the tires and the ropes, and you're going under, and then you would run up your little legs, and you just go over the on top of the plank of wood, and you would jump the fence. Like the fence was probably about six foot at the time, you know, a bit lower, a bit lower. Afterwards, it was six foot, and they changed it. And um, yeah, always have had that. Always had the obstacle course. Always on the weekend. It was phenomenal. It was just like to think back of everything, and you're like why and then all of a sudden you find yourself being a teenager going off world and you're meeting this person you've never met and I'm just standing there and I knew I just knew that you you just had to listen yeah sometimes it's the best option yeah so we would have the same training you know like like soldiers would but it was the weirdest like some training would be like uh we'd had like tables but they weren't tables. They were pretty solid, like hurdles. And I would, they had this black, sorry, I'm playing with the blues tack here. They had this black little device and they had what I can describe it looking like. It was like an Xbox controller. Mm. Right? No buttons or anything like that. The buttons were on the side where you, where you would hold your thumbs, right? So at the front they had little slits and every time this woman would, um, press these buttons these silver little discs would come flying out and I would have to jump through over these tables from one end of the room to the other end of the room and my god if those silver discs hit you it was like your whole muscles it was like being electrocuted you know how you get really weak and sore and 
you'd wake up at in the morning and you're like absolutely in excruciating pain. So it was that. It was also the those stupid man that black mansion forever going there and up the stairs, down the stairs. And, you know, there was even a, a time where I've seen the cloning cloning centre where I've seen actual people in those little baths with the clear roofs, rooftop things, and it was just horrifying for me. And um, But that's the training. And even being in in camo gear with your, with your guns and everything, and it would be like these two guys and it would be me and one other girl. It was a small group all the time and we were just at it all the time. It was just exhausting. It was just like being in the army, nonstop, off world and on in here because my dad never let up and he always said to me, you know, one day you'll thank me. I never got that opportunity because he passed away, but I'm um, just like. Now, do you think him, uh, your late father, wanting to create this obstacle course and uh you know whatnot yeah, yeah, yeah and it was a means like i can't help but think that he was preparing you for all this yeah right? so mm -hmm. at some level and you know need to know being what it is he might have just been asked uh by what he considered to be a friendly person or someone that he didn't want to cross let's say that Okay, we'll put her through her paces, training and what have you, and that will augment whatever training she's going to go through when she's with you guys, right? Or mm -hmm. um, do you think that maybe he just got this idea, burr in the saddle kind of thing, where I I'm going to do this with my little girl? No, uh, I truly think that somebody did something to my dad for him to think like that because he was never really, yes, he was very strict, Yes, he made us stand, made me, not my sister. My sister could do whatever she wanted, but I couldn't. So he would make me stand at attention, call me his little soldier all the time. Since I was born, oh, I'm a little soldier. So I don't know whether he was being programmed by somebody or something to do that to me. Now I understand. Now I understand why, obviously. You know, you needed those skills. I live my life with those skills, um, being very aware with my surroundings and everything else. And like I always say to my kids, I'm so sorry I sound like a Fruit Loop half the time, but please just be aware of your surroundings. And, um, you know, it's just, I don't know. But when I was in Croatia, especially during the war, all that kicked in, James, you know. And well, I imagine you're now in a war-torn city. Yep. And getting rocketed. Yeah. 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 I was in um yeah, in Sarajevo when all that happened and wouldn't wish that upon my worst enemy if I had one. So, you know, it was just horrifying. Very um just I don't know, came back home with PTSD. So mm, no, no, I imagine. Uh but um dad's training and the training that I got from Joachim, I'm telling you, really helped. Really when you helped. were you were that dark period of your life, that's what got you over the hump. Yep. Yep. Because I would zone out and something would zone in. You know? And um hate to say it, but like it's like a split personality. Yeah. Then the lovely Carol went in, but something else came out. Yeah, because they didn't and want the they didn't want the lovely life. Carol, and they wanted, you know, no, no, hardcore no. Karen. They want hardcore Karen. They, in there. Had, they wanted the aggressive asshole Carol coming out of that, and they surely got her. But I fought really hard. Very rare for her to pop up again. That's for sure. But um, I do understand why. My dad did what he did and what John did because John and dad, especially John, he had five girls and he only picked on me and his eldest, Amanda. He never bothered with any of the other girls. My dad never bothered with my sister, always just me, always with me. And it's just like that is just when you think back, 
when I think back of it all, it's just very strange, very, very strange. But um, even like one incident when we were in, um, I won't even try to pronounce where we were, but we're where, we were where my dad was originally from. And we were on this bus waiting to, you know, get on this ferry to get on the other side of this lake. And the bus got stopped by militias, by Serbian militias, and they took off. And lucky I had this big jacket and it might sound funny, but back then I still looked like a boy. I, did, I think half the Croatian girls look like their fathers, so I look very much like my dad. But he took off all women and all girls off that bus. We never saw them again, James. I couldn't tell you what happened to them. I don't really particularly want to know, um, you know. So there was a lot of um, a lot of things like that happening over there. And, um, yeah, I just, my whole face just dropped and just, you know, head down and thank goodness they didn't look my way because I tell you what, if I had girly clothes on and my hair down and nothing, and didn't have that, you know, black beanie on and all that stuff and no makeup on, I assure you I would have been off that bus. And um, it was just, I don't know, it was a nightmare. That whole whole thing was just a nightmare, even afterwards when everything settled and you could go to a cafe and just to see the horrifying things that you saw you know, sex trafficking was rife then mm. at the end of the war and in the middle of it. Um, even had I was uh, walking from a place called Bash Chashia. It's a place that um, sells, has little restaurants, sells all the um, beautiful teapots and coffee pots and teacups and just it was beautiful. Anyway, I was walking home from there. And I saw a man walking with his hands up in his in the air, screaming and running that someone was after him. And I looked over and I saw in the distance you can see a group of people running, chasing, laughing. And I'm like, oh, my God, this felt like the Hunger Games. Like was he, he was literally being hunted, hunted. And I spoke to my friend, my, a friend of mine and my cousin at the time and said because she passed away. And um, I said, what in the world was that? And she goes, oh, they kidnap people mm. and they let them go in the forest and then they hunt them down like animals. Yes. And I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm. And then we went to this cafe and there was this guy, he was an American journalist, right? Um, but he was an American journalist. He was talking to me. He was, you know, da, 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 da. my cousin saw what was happening. I was too stupid back then to know any better. She pulled me away and she goes, you know that he's going to kidnap you for sex trafficking, Carol. We've got to leave now. And we left and we left with a couple of her friends and I was just like, oh, I can't cool. believe it. I can't believe that. And then, yeah, no, I just. Where, where did this happen at? So this happened in Sarajevo when we went to a cafe after the fact when everything died down. I think it was like three or four days after the war ended and, um, yeah, still shooting going on and it was just horrifying. But um, we, we would even go and someone would have vodka, someone would bring an egg, someone had this, someone would that. I mean, during it, James, I'm not even joking, like a litre of oil cost somebody, you know, would cost you $100. So it was very hard. Food was very hard to come by. So we would all get together if somebody got something and try and make a meal out of one egg to feed three of us. Mm. But, um, yeah, to actually see what one would call the Hunger Games be played out right in front of you being trained by my dad, being trained by John, um, which I had to call him Uncle John. Jeez. But, um, yeah, yeah, it was just when I think back to it all, it was just very weird. Even when I would walk.
was just very eerie and just, you know, when you're a kid, you always I was always looking over my shoulder, but nobody was there. It was just a weird, weird reaction. And yeah, it was just bizarre. When I think back, like, why would a kid be walking home from school and having to look over her shoulder all the time is just beyond me. But now I understand why, because, you know, when I was 13, I had this car just appear and follow follow me. I had this white Valiant I've spoken to you before. And that for almost a year would follow me everywhere. And when I was at home, I peered outside because it would be up my drive, my parents' driveway and I had a look and they always had the light inside the car. And when I had a look, those shoulders and Valiants were pretty wide cars and their shoulders were almost touching. So there were pretty big fellas in there and I'm just like, I don't understand. And when they were there, my sister and her husband at the time would come and they would just leave. They would just pull out and drive because they would drive away very slowly. And by the time my brother, ex-brother-in-law would um, sit in the car and try and catch them, and he always had the zippy little fast cars, he had a Datsun, surely the street, because it's pretty long, you could have caught them. And he goes, I, I got up to the corner. They were just gone. Like everybody knows how loud a Valiant is. It's pretty like loud with the V8s. So you so, could literally hear them. But he said it was there, nothing. It was just dead quiet. And you can see down the street. So it was just weird things like that. What are the vehicles going on to a road or, or, or a tube or a tunnel or something? No, they were actually like they were just up here. If I walked out, James, if I walked out of my house and I would go to the shop for my mum and I'd get out of the driveway, walk down the street, that would appear like that mm. out of nowhere. Like how the hell do men, what, what what are they doing? Just sitting there spying on when I come out of the house. Um, they knew when my parents left to go to their friend's house they would come sit up the driveway. They would idle behind me and follow me from the shops to the shops back at home. They never did anything, but I always thought that, you know, they would do something, do something. So I stopped going out. I said to mum and dad, I'm not going. Send my sister, I'm not going. No. And my next door neighbour, his wife, she saw everything. And she's like, you people... Don't you know this car's following your daughter? But um, like I said, that one incident, they were up on in the driveway and they were just sitting there idling and they stayed there for a long time and um, they went to back out and they just drove off. They always drive off really slowly. And mm. just as they drove off, my sister and her husband came and I ran outside and Oh my God, they're out here again. Blah, blah, blah. And Frank was like, What the hell? And he bolted into the car and he just flew down that street. They were gone. It was just impossible for them to be gone that quick. Impossible. This, I'm yeah. talking about not even 30 seconds, 20 seconds. It was impossible. They just disappeared. So, you know, having all that with the training have had one bizarre childhood it was very very strange to go through all that even up to the age of 29 when i came back from you, croatia could, could you talk about in the time you got left the um the training like i'm trying to get a timeline so were you in you go to croatia first australia back to croatia so or, I was born in Australia and my parents were very homesick. So every year <laughs> we would go back for six months at a time. Um, when I was five, like we went back when I was very, very little, I don't remember that. So, but when I was five and when I saw that craft, they absolutely got scared and they go, right, we're going overseas. So then we oh. stayed overseas for a few years. Came back, finished school, let's go back. I think I was about 15 at the time. 
and um yeah so we went there again so we, then we stayed six months came back when again the next year stayed six months so every six months we would go back and stay six months six months in Australia six months in in Croatia and we would travel around we would go to where my mum's from and then we would stay where my dad is from and things like that I was half homeschooled I was half taken to school and then when we came back we settled a little bit more so I can finish year 12 and everything else and I went to uni and um, then we went back and that's when the war hit mm. and then I was stuck until I could leave because you can't just up and leave so yeah, and that, that was- would that would be the uh, what they call the civil war in Yugoslavia back then yes uh, okay and were you used in any ops in that time frame after all the training you'd gone through? Well, I don't have any memory, but I do recall me using the training that I got to because where our apartment was, and I, I can show you photos where we were, there were tons, we had to dig, they were not asked, but the soldiers dug out tunnels so you would crawl through these tunnels to get to the other side where the shops were. And um, everything that I did, crawling and running, dropping on my knees and actually because I did have a weapon and holding the weapon like this and just going like this through the trenches, I mean, not one, you could say, civilian would know how to do that. And I'm like, how the hell? And, like, when you're little, when you grow up, you don't remember everything. Um, You lose some memory of when you were a little kid. You don't remember absolutely everything. And I'm like, how do I remember? How do I know to do this? This is bizarre. And then when my dad goes, yeah, I'm sorry, like when we were back here in Croatia, in Australia, my dad goes, yeah, sorry, darling. You know, (laughs) I did train you to know everything and everything. And it's like, oh, okay. And I said, so all that stuff in the backyard, that wasn't just for play. That was yeah. was for real, Dad. I said, come on, tell me. I said, was that for real? And he said, yeah, that's for that was for real. You were always my little soldier. You were meant for greater things than your sister. Wow. And then after you left Croatia, yes. how long did it take for you to start being accessed and used here straight away didn't I don't well because I went from Croatia we flew to Germany and I remember in Germany I went to sleep and I had a mission but it was nothing uh very scary or anything like that it was just talking to Joachim Mm. and um spoke to him woke up and I'm like I don't know what's going on and I never really put two and two together or delved into, I don't, I, I've never understood why I went to sleep and woke up somewhere else um, until I moved to Bendigo. That's when I really delved into why and had all these questions and, um, yeah, really delved into everything but. It was just very, very bizarre. So I know I was used, but when you're in that heightened state of mind of survival and um, that you don't sleep much, um, you you just don't think. You can't. You yeah, can't. But you're sluggish yeah. because of the yeah. mental and physical exhaustion. Yes. It's hard to even think yeah. straight. Because you're malnourished. You haven't eaten for two weeks. Uh, very, very little. We had very little. Um, but we always had coffee, unfortunately. <laughs> mm. That I, I said to my auntie, I said, Oh, God, you want your coffee? Look, like, how much have you stored? And he goes, She, she goes, What shrugs? <laughs> she just shrugs. And like she was, she was suffering from PTSD. And to be honest, I didn't even know what that was until I came back home and I was just so traumatised about well, from it all because I've, I had to endure something that no no one from Australia should. But I've just found myself on my own with my auntie and my cousin stuck in a, in a war zone and came to learn 
you know, when the sirens went off, we would sit there, oh, it won't be too bad. We can stay where we in the, in the apartment. But when the violins came on, holy shit, did we go into the basement? You know, you just bolt for your life. And I just, I don't know. But, like, now surviving all that, knowing all my training, you just kind of know why, but you still have all these answers as to why, and it's just I'm done, <laughs> I'm done. I just want it to be finished. But I know in my gut I'm, I won't be finished until my last breath on this earth, I think. I think, I don't know. Well, you know. it's quite a, a story, and the fact that it tracked you from Croatia to Australia and back mm -hmm. and you start getting used by whoever the, the my life controller is here, be the Australian American, whatever the case may be. Yeah. It seems like there was some kind of handover. Yeah. Um, well, I was always surrounded by American soldiers when we we're in Sarajevo in our apartment and always surrounded by them always. And I just found that really odd, even though most of them were American soldiers there. But I just found it very odd, very, very odd. And I never forget one always used to watch me very closely in between everything, especially when me and my cousin Gordano used to go through the trenches. He wouldn't even look at her. He would look at me and just, you know, his eye, Ugh, gross, just... um. To endure all that is just, um, I don't know, just thankful I'm still breathing, I guess. Yeah, because uh, it's exploitative to the nth degree mm -hmm. but with no acknowledgement of one's own personal sovereignty. So no. I, I'm really thankful that you're, you're sharing this with the audience because it gives them a, a bird's eye view of you know yeah. what it's like, you know domestically uh family interpersonal relationships etc cetera, etc cetera. well uh, i want to thank you for coming back carol and mm -hmm. uh, you know sharing and i want to have you back in sometime hopefully things will back off for quite a long time yeah, and like you I can said, actually just settle down yeah it's actually been very quiet since that and um you know i don't know i'm just grateful right now for the peace and quiet so I can settle into this home and it's actually a beautiful house and very grateful for it, even though we do have a bit of bumps and <laughs> at night. Just used to it, I guess. Um, but otherwise it's been quiet. It's been quiet and hopefully it'll remain like that. Well, you gotta live somewhere. So yeah. anyhow, thank you so much again, Carol, for coming back. And uh to our dear listeners out there. Uh, wherever you may be, whatever you may be doing, have a very pleasant time. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.